out by a roar louder than any noise real foot had ever heard. The earth vibrated from the sound waves, and then it heaved in mighty spasms that splintered giant trees and sent them crashing down into newly formed crevices. Then came a rushing wall of water that swallowed up the village, covered the whole countryside, and formed a great lake. From 13 Tennessee Ghosts and Jeffrey by Katherine Tucker Wyndham. Hey y'all, so it's been quite the summer. As you know, I've been all over the place. I've been traveling to conventions and shows and doing ghost tours, all sorts of stuff. And I am just so ready to settle back in and tell you some stories. And we're going to do that today. We're going to explore some of the old legends and grim history surrounding Real Foot Lake up in the northwestern corner of Tennessee. But first, I want to tell y'all about some of the incredible podcasters that I had a chance to hang out with this summer. And I want to invite you to check out their promos at the end of this episode. Now, I know everyone has different tastes, so maybe not all of them are for you, but I'd love it if you gave them a chance. These folks take such pride in their work, and they all care so much about delivering a great show for listeners. So let's go ahead and let me tell you a little bit about them. So a lot of y'all are going to recognize the first one you'll hear, as some of you were turned on to this show by it. it. It's Weird Darkness. I had such a blast hanging out with Darren, who very graciously invited me on the Weird Darkness live stream while we're at the Dark History and Horror Con, that I just want everyone who doesn't already listen to Weird Darkness to give it a chance. Darren has an incredible voice. And he does a narrative podcast that covers everything from ghosts and hauntings to aliens and cryptids. Look, I'll be honest. I have such great respect for what Darren does that I actually can't even listen to Weird Darkness anymore because I get jealous of how great he sounds telling a story. So there might be a little bromance there. But anyway, in addition to Weird Darkness's promo, you're also going to hear a couple by a few new podcasts, one called The Riverlands and another one called Weird Mythic. Both these shows explore the paranormal from different angles. And then, last but not least, I'm going to tack on the promo for my dear friends over at Our True Crime Podcast. Jen and Cam are wonderful people who I absolutely adore on a personal level. They've been podcasting for a while now and have over 200 episodes that are well-researched true crime with big cases and little cases. And unlike most kind of personality-driven shows... They get straight to the point and they leave all the fluff and discussion for the end. So I love these ladies. And if y'all are into true crime, I hope you will give them a chance today. Now, here's the biggest news of all. On October 14th, I will be putting on a live stage show at the Palace Theater in Gallatin, Tennessee. For about an hour and a half, I'm going to be on stage slinging stories about ghosts and haunted places old legends and folklore, and just about anything in between, right? So tickets are on sale now at southerngothicmedia.com. Please go ahead and grab yours while there's still a chance. But I'm going to warn you, this is a haunted theater, so there's no telling what's going to happen in there that night. Now, I'm also going to be joined by Eric from the Unseen Paranormal Podcast, who's going to open the show with some of his friends discussing the theater itself, its history, and some of the investigations that they've done there. So please don't miss it. You can either head over to our website or just go ahead and click the link in the show notes for tickets. Also, just a heads up, my introverted sister is coming. So if you ever wanted to meet a real life archivist, Brianne will be there manning the merch table and, you know, probably signing autographs if you ask. So please come and spend an evening with us at the Palace Theater on October 14th in Gallatin, Tennessee. Now, with that, let's head to the northwestern corner of Tennessee and talk a little bit about where today's episode takes place, Real Foot Lake. This particular body of water is unlike any other in the state. It's a shallow, natural lake that actually has more in common with the bayous of the Deep South than the other more open and expansive lakes of Tennessee and Kentucky. In fact, it's actually a flooded cypress forest whose creation dates back to the early 19th century 
when massive earthquakes rocked the area and dramatically changed the landscape. For that reason, it's actually the only large lake in the state of Tennessee that isn't man-made. Of course, over the years, real foot has been a source of much prosperity for farmers, fishermen, and other locals. And today, it's part of an 18,000-acre natural area where folks come to visit and enjoy the beauty of the natural world. But the history of Realfoot Lake isn't necessarily as tranquil as the present. Legend says that the origins of Realfoot Lake can be traced back to the actions of a mighty native chieftain who either maliciously mistakenly made a decision that cost his people their lives and their land. Whether this is true or not is unknown, but in addition to that legend, the lake was also home to the notoriously violent group known simply as the Night Riders. My name is Brandon Schecksnyder, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Legend says that at the end of the 17th century, a mighty chieftain oversaw the Chickasaw people of northwestern Tennessee. Yet in spite of the man's skillful leadership and the respect given to him by his tribe, the chief was plagued by a heavy heart, for his son was born with a deformed foot. Fortunately, the father's concern dissipated as his son grew and it became clear that in spite of his physical differences, the young man was just as physically capable as the other boys. He just moved a little differently. As a result, the great chieftain's son earned the nickname Colapin, or as early American settlers were said to have called him, Realfoot. Eventually, the time came for Realfoot to follow in his father's footsteps the tribe's chief, but much like his father before him, he too was plagued with a heavy heart. But the reason for his pain was much different. Realfoot was lonely. Some say that this was his own doing, that Realfoot simply wasn't interested in any of the women of his own tribe, while others claim that this loneliness was due to his physical differences and that the Chickasaw girls often mocked him behind his back. Whatever the cause, Chief Realfoot believed his only chance at finding love was outside of his own tribe. So he looked to the stories that his father once told him. Stories of tribes who dwelled many days to the south of their village. Tribes filled with mighty warriors and beautiful women. And so determined to find love, Realfoot and a group of men set out the following spring and began a journey south by canoe. It took many days of travel, but eventually they entered Choctaw lands and met the great Chief Kapaya. The leader gave them a warm and friendly welcome and invited Realfoot to share a peace pipe with him that evening. Realfoot gratefully accepted the invitation, unknowing what was about to happen, as it was there, that evening, when he first laid eyes on the woman he had been searching for, Chief Kapaya's daughter, laughing eyes. The girl was far more beautiful than any woman Realfoot could have ever imagined, and almost instantly he became determined to have laughing eyes as his bride. But Chief Kapaya did not approve, 
and he became angered by the mere suggestion of the marriage. Warning Realfoot that his daughter would only be wed to a worthy Choctaw chief, and most certainly not one with a deformity such as his. Then, to prove his decision was true, Chief Kapaya called forth the Great Spirit to warn Realfoot that if he dared attempt to steal Laughing Eyes away from her tribe, a great calamity would fall upon his village, and the result would be utter destruction and decimation of his people. Realfoot respectfully heeded the warning, and the following day, he and his men left the Choctaw to return home. Yet Realfoot could not get Laughing Eyes out of his head. Over the following year, he frequently had to remind himself that in order to protect his people, he had to let her go, and he did that time and time again. But ultimately, his desire for Laughing Eyes overcame reason. Realfoot began to think that surely nothing the Great Spirit could do would be worse than life without this woman as his bride. So that summer, he made the decision to journey south and steal Laughing Eyes away from her tribe. But then, the night before he was meant to depart, Realfoot suffered terrible dreams, nightmares of the ground shaking and water flowing, of death and of destruction. And although he knew it was a warning from the Great Spirit, a fact that even the village elders confirmed, Realfoot could not let Laughing Eyes go, so he traveled south with a band of warriors. Upon their arrival, they waited until the middle of the night, and when the Choctaw village was sound asleep, the Chickasaw men crept in and stole Laughing Eyes. But the girl had heard the warning that the Great Spirit had given Realfoot one year prior, and she was terrified of what horror might befall her. Yet the Chickasaw leader refused to let Laughing Eyes return home. Now, excited about the success of his mission and looking onward to his future, Realfoot sent a messenger ahead of them bearing the news. So days later, as they neared the Chickasaw village, they could hear the pounding of the ceremonial drums ready to greet them in celebration. The wedding ceremony began immediately upon the couple's arrival, and at first everything went as it was supposed to. But then, the earth began to tremble. People tried to run and flee to the hills, but the fierceness of the ground's movement was too much. And to their dismay, they could only stagger and fall. Chief Realfoot and Laughing Eyes knew exactly what was happening. The Great Spirit was angry and had stamped his foot upon the ground to show it. Of course, the worst was still yet to come. Upon hearing the angered stomp of the Great Spirit, the Father of Waters responded by raising the Mississippi River high over its banks, allowing the water to flow fiercely into the depressions of the Great Spirit's footprint inundating the Chickasaw people's lands with a great flood. Then, when everything was over, a beautiful lake rested in the place that was once Realfoot's village. As for the whereabouts of the chieftain, his new bride, and the Chickasaw people, all that's known is that they didn't survive. According to folklorist Catherine Tucker Wyndham, quote, Some storytellers say that only the old cottonmouth moccasins know where the bodies lie. Others tell of hearing the muffled beat of tom-toms on certain nights and then seeing the shadowy figure of a man reeling through the forest as though he were trying to escape from great danger. Catherine Tucker Wyndham published this version of the legend 
in her 1977 work, 13 Tennessee Ghosts and Jeffrey. However, this now well-known tale of real foot and laughing eyes, which is often even considered of Choctaw origin, may not have actually been the first to describe the beginning of Real Foot Lake. The 1910 edition of the Taylor Trotwood magazine includes a story by Vera Eastwood titled The Legend of Real Foot Lake, which also tells the story of Real Foot. However, this is not a man who falls in love and can't help himself, but rather a violent chieftain who fought in the French and Indian War to protect his tribe's holdings, all the while acquiring a great hatred of the quote, pale faces. According to Eastwood, real foot terrorized settlers all across Tennessee by any means necessary. She described him as everything from satanic to black-hearted, and that his demise finally came after he kidnapped a beautiful young white woman named Violet Vincent. But before his death, real foot cursed the land that his home sat upon so that white men would never be able to live on it, a curse that would come true in 10 years' time. And that's exactly what happened. 10 years later, in 1811, a farmer saw a black creek of water oozing from the ground. He laughingly called it real foot, remembering the curse. But little did he know what was about to occur. Quote, With a noise as of falling mountains, the earth gave way, and with the roar of a liberated monster, a huge black tide of rushing water came filling Big Basin. For days it continued. The father of waters drew back from his course. For a year the disturbances occurred at intervals. Then came the days of smiling sunshine. Superstitious hunters called the great basin of water Realfoot Lake. Storms are but the fury of Realfoot. His curse is on the pale face. And woe to him who tempts the savage anger of the evil spirit. These are the legends of how Real Foot Lake came to be. However, the truth is much different than the stories that have been told. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, Real Foot Lake was formed from the region's upheavals during the New Madrid earthquakes between December 16, 1811 and March 15, 1812. Centered around New Madrid, Missouri, the earthquakes were the largest in American history, and the months of activity resulted in major changes to the land over a widespread area, including changing the course of rivers. Tremors from some of the largest quakes were felt as far away as Washington, D.C., and according to some reports, even Quebec, nearly 1,400 miles away. Of these changes in the landform, one of the most significant was an immense hole that opened up in northwestern Tennessee, a hole that would become the basin of Real Foot Lake after the mighty Mississippi River overflowed its banks, filling it and flooding the once dense cypress forest. At this point in time, when these earthquakes were occurring, the area was still very much wild frontier land, and as such, there were few American settlers there to document the drastic changes. However, a letter written by a settler of the Missouri Territory has survived, describing the enormous lake that had formed on the other side of the Mississippi River. This 1816 correspondence written by Miss Eliza Bryan to Methodist preacher Lorenz Dow, states, On the 16th of December, 1811, about 2 o'clock a.m., a violent shock of earthquake, accompanied by a very awful noise, resembling loud by distant thunder, but hoarse and vibrating, followed by complete saturation with sulfurous vapors, causing total darkness. The screams of the inhabitants, the cries of the fowls and beasts of every species, 
the falling trees, and the roaring of the Mississippi, the current of which was retrograde for a few minutes, owing, as it supposed, to an eruption of its bed, formed a scene truly horrible. From this time until the 4th of February, the earth was in continual agitation, visibly waving as a gentle sea. Then on the 7th, at about 4 o'clock a.m., a concussion took place so much more violent than those preceding it that it is denominated as the hard shock. The Mississippi first seemed to recede from its banks, and its water gathered up like a mountain, leaving for a moment many boats on the bare sand, then rising 15 to 20 feet perpendicularly and expanding. As it were, at the same time, the banks overflowed with a retrograde current rapid as a torrent. From Eliza's letter, it seems entirely possible that the hard shock that agitated the waters of the Mississippi River could have been the event that would ultimately fill in what would become Real Foot Lake. And this new lake was also written about by Eliza. Lately has been discovered that a lake was formed on the opposite side of the Mississippi, in Indian country, upwards of 100 miles in length and from one to six miles in width with a depth of 10 to 50 feet. It has communication with the river at both ends and it is conjectured that it will not be many years before the principal part, if not the whole of the Mississippi, will pass that way. While well, Eliza Bryan's letter is certainly an excellent account of the severity of the earthquakes and the new lake they created, it isn't exactly the best source for scientific accuracy, particularly in the case of the size of the new lake. Tennessee historian Samuel Cole William later wrote that the sheer size of real foot as written by Brian, was a, quote, fantastic exaggeration typical of that time of excitement. Described as 100 miles in length, the lake was actually closer to 14 and with a width of about four and a half. On early maps, the lake was sometimes identified as Line Lake in reference to the state boundary or Wood Lake. And it wasn't until some time in the 1860s that maps began to first call it Real Foot, a name that wasn't necessarily in reference to a Chickasaw chieftain, but rather the Real Foot River, which prior to the earthquakes was a tributary of the Mississippi. But does this mean that it wasn't the great spirit stomping his foot that caused the lake's creation? Well, that might not ever truly be proven one way or the other. However, it seems that when the lake was formed, the land wasn't actually inhabited by the Chickasaw people, as the legend suggests. Radiocarbon dating of artifacts found during archaeological investigations indicates there had been an active Native American presence in the Real Foot River Basin as early as 1650 CE, and it's been speculated that those in the area may have been the Monsalapea tribe, a group who historically occupied the Upper Ohio River before moving south in the late 17th century after invading tribes of the Iroquois Confederacy sought to control their hunting grounds. But by the 1800s, when the lake was formed, the population of indigenous people had already diminished and the increasing encroachment of white settlers exacerbated their exodus. So by the time the legend of Realfoot Lake was said to have occurred, the land was really nothing more than hunting grounds, not an established village. Of course, there's more to Realfoot Lake than its origin story, and the occurrences that happened there following its origins are far more sinister than the tale of Realfoot and Laughing Eyes. We'll explore some of this violent history and more after the break. While the legend of Chief Realfoot and his bride laughing eyes is certainly the most popular story surrounding Real Foot Lake today. This exquisite natural body of water has also been the scene of significant violence 
that ultimately caused the state of Tennessee to take ownership of it. No one quite knows when white settlers first began staking claims in this particular region. But documentary evidence suggests that folks arrived as early as the turn of the century, prior to the New Madrid earthquakes. Since these men got here before the lake was even formed, they attempted to retain title to the ground under the water. However, following the 1818 Jackson Purchase, which paid the Chickasaws $300,000, for 10,700 square miles of land, new families began to arrive, settling in and around this beautiful body of water. These new locals treated the lake and its offerings as a common resource, and for nearly a century, everyone from farmers, fishermen, and hunters built their livelihoods on what Realfoot Lake and the surrounding area had to offer. But then, in the early 1900s, trouble came to real foot. Due to the rise of large-scale agricultural corporations, which included things like cotton cultivation, companies were looking to expand their business into regions that had previously been dominated by individual family-operated farms, regions like West Tennessee and Kentucky. So a group of wealthy investors began purchasing the property along the shoreline of Realfoot Lake. And as you can expect, the people who built their lives and livelihoods there were furious. They believed the lake was theirs, and these outsiders wanted to take away that access that their families had relied on for generations. So in order to enforce their legal rights to the land, the lake, and most importantly, the sole rights to the fish in the lake, the outside investors formed the West Tennessee Land Company. Social tensions were then further escalated as many of these large-scale out-of-town planters began hiring black farmers to work their property as sharecroppers. This was salt on the wounds for much of the local populace, which was almost exclusively white. Not only were their livelihoods now being threatened, but people they deemed as inferior were seemingly the ones taking it. This influx of black farmers now gave the white residents physical targets at which to direct their rage. And out of this anger grew an organization to terrorize these men and their families. The group was known simply as the Night Riders. According to the Tennessee State Museum, quote, Local residents had read about Night Riders in the Black Patch War in Middle Tennessee and Kentucky. Although that situation was still ongoing, the actions of local farmers so far had shocked the local officials into studying their needs. It seemed like a good example to the Lake County residents. Two prosperous farmers, Tom Johnson and Tom Wilson, along with Johnson's cousin, Garrett Johnson, formed the Lake County Night Riders. Eventually, Hundreds became involved. Meetings were held in local homes, and participants were sworn to secrecy. The majority were farm owners, hired hands, and sharecroppers with a few fishermen. Some members were forced to participate. Before long, men with criminal backgrounds also joined. These men donned hoods and masks, and they rode horseback in the night, threatening and violently attacking these black farmers and their families, destroying property and enacting what they believed was vigilante justice. Then, on October 3, 1908, the violence reached a tipping point when a group of 50 misled night riders lynched David Walker and six of his family members, including his wife and five children, the youngest, still an infant. According to newspaper accounts of the event, Walker, a black man, had sworn at a white woman, which was considered by many to be a violation of Jim Crow custom, if not the law itself. But perhaps the real reason was that David Walker was a landowner with a 221 and a half acre farm that he worked himself. And after Walker's death, a neighbor 
who is a white man, took ownership of the property. Word of this violent lynching grew, and it eventually received national attention. Kentucky Governor Augusta C. Wilson condemned the murders and offered a $500 reward for the arrest and conviction of any night Rider who participated in the violence. But no one was ever prosecuted for the crime. Two weeks later, on October 19, 1908, violence once again erupted as the Knight Riders kidnapped two white attorneys who were engaged by the West Tennessee Land Company to enforce its claims on the purchased land. Captain Quentin Rankin, who was also a shareholder in the company, was hanged and shot, and Colonel R.Z. Taylor, who was initially reported as murdered, actually managed to escape his captors by swimming across the lake in the dark, severely wounded. Now that it was clear that the Knight Riders' aggressions were not just limited to black farmers and their families, Tennessee Governor Malcolm Rice Patterson ordered the state militia be sent to suppress the violence and that an investigation into the death of Captain Rankin be held. In the end, hundreds of suspects were arrested and a group of 32 men were charged with murder. Ultimately, six men were convicted and sentenced to death, and two received 20 years. But in the end, none of them ever served their sentences, as the Tennessee State Supreme Court overturned the convictions in 1909, so no one was ever punished. However, the Knight Riders were never seen again. And it wasn't long after the violence of October 19, 1908, the state of Tennessee moved to take control of Real Foot Lake and officially make it public property. It took nearly two decades for this to happen. Years were spent arguing property rights issues, and levees had to be constructed to maintain water levels so as to settle these issues. The Tennessee State Park and Forest Commission was ordered to determine precise boundaries of the area, and it would ultimately be given the responsibility for this and future state parks to guarantee their public use. Real Foot Lake is now designated as a National Wildlife Refuge, and in 1966, it earned the National Park Service's designation of National Natural Landmark. how Real Foot became a lake continues to be the source of legends, as certainly it is the result of earthquakes so profound that they caused the Mississippi River to flow backward. But was that natural disaster in fact natural, or was it the product of a great curse? My name is Brandon Schecksneider. And you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently produced podcast created by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider with the support of listeners like you. This month, we'd like to thank our most recent Patreon supporters, Douglas Jones, D. Mark, Dolores Riggins, Melissa Ramsey, Tammy Ryan, Jonathan Heiser, and Julia Shavosian. If you're interested in joining us and receiving additional content, including ad-free episodes, head over to our Patreon page today. The link is in the show notes. Lucky Lady Shacks. Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. I'm Darren Marlar, the host of Weird Darkness, where I bring you true stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, 
unsolved, and unexplained. Named one of the 20 best storytellers in podcasting by Podcast Business Journal. Named one of the best paranormal podcasts of the year by Player FM, Feedspot, and Podcast Magazine. Whether it's ghosts, aliens, monsters, murders, or unsolved mysteries, I cover it all on Weird Darkness. Episodes posted seven days a week. Find Weird Darkness on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and everywhere you can find podcasts. Or listen now online at WeirdDarkness.com. Good evening, friends. We're Jason and Kayla, and we're here to be your guides along the back roads and waterways of a forgotten America. Through aging coal towns and ancient sloughs, and down moonlit gravel roads and into the darkest corners of the forgotten Midwest, it's a dark and lonely stretch of geography here in Middle America, a shadowy liminal space where haunted history comes together with the weird and the monstrous, and it's a little place that we like to call the Riverlands. The Riverlands podcast is a love letter to the forgotten history of America's heartland. It's that place where the paranormal comes out and influences our daily lives. It's a show about murder and mystery and mayhem, and yes, even a few monsters too. We have a bunch of great stories you've never heard, and we can't wait to share them with you. So check us out wherever you get your podcasts or at riverlandspodcast.com. And we'll be waiting for you out here somewhere along the back roads and waterways of the Riverlands. Thank you and good night, everyone. That's Serena over there. And that's Naomi. And we are the hosts of Weird Mythic Podcast. Yes, we are. Our show, Weird Mythic, covers stories about cryptids, which is what brought us together to create the show. But we also like to talk about anything paranormal and strange that happens in the world. We post episodes every Sunday on different topics, and we would love to have more listeners. We're on all podcast platforms, and you can find us on all social media sites as well. Give us a listen, send us some personal stories to share on the show, and we will love you forever. Yes, we will. We would love some personal stories, some cryptid encounters, and we hope that you listen and tune into the show. You can listen to Weird Mythic Podcasts wherever you get your podcast fix. Last year, there were nearly 22,000 murders in the U.S. Not surprisingly, more than 200 true crime podcasts launch every year in the U.S. alone. There's no shortage of crimes and no shortage of crime podcasts to cover them. But none of those shows have the heart of our true crime podcast. Thank goodness. Well, hell, they know. didn't even have seatbelt laws back then. They never wore seatbelt. Yeah, it's fine. He could not remember exactly what happened and thought that he had blacked out. That was about it. That's all he could tell oh, officers. No. He was drawing things, saying the, the thoughts won't stop. I want to see, see how this plays out. It's heartbreaking. Isn't it time you made our true crime podcast your true crime podcast? Our true crime podcast, available on all your favorite podcasting apps.